Welcome to NTD News. I'm Steve Lanson for Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. Black conservative leaders defend Georgia's voting reform law. They say a majority of black voters support voter ID. And there's another agenda behind Democrats' criticism. Montana Governor Greg Gianforte signs two new election integrity bills into law. One tightens voter ID laws, another eliminates election day registrations. We look at how Democrats plan to respond. A high profile case is set to come before the Supreme Court next week, but some Democrats say Justice Amy Coney Barrett should recuse herself before it starts. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo joins lawmakers on Capitol Hill to draft a new bill aimed at keeping sanctions on Iran. It would challenge efforts by Biden to lift sanctions. And the U.S. adds over 100 more countries to the do not travel list. The list now includes countries like Israel and Canada. That's a jump from only 34 countries listed earlier this week. President Biden makes an ambitious new pledge to cut greenhouse gases. He sets a goal double the level former President Barack Obama established in 2015 when the U.S. entered the Paris Climate Agreement. The United States sets out on the road to cut greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. Biden made the announcement during a virtual climate summit with 40 leader, world leaders. Former President Donald Trump removed America from the climate pact and chose a different path towards sustainability. Emissions dropped during Trump's time in office, but some believe the decrease was too small and have pressured Biden to take more drastic action. The United States rejoined the Paris Agreement on Biden's first day in office. He has said he wants the country to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Biden administration officials say they've analyzed how every sector can cut pollution. Conservative black leaders are speaking up in support of Georgia's voting reform law. They say critics are trying to sow division and misinformation and that it's all part of a bigger agenda. A group of conservative black leaders is defending Georgia's new voting reform law against criticism. They wrote to leaders of the Senate Judiciary Committee saying, critics have no idea that a majority of black voters across the country support the key provision under attack by critics. The simple requirement that voters be able to identify themselves when voting. President Biden has criticized the law as a racist effort to suppress votes. In March, he tweeted, the Georgia voting law is a blatant attack on the right to vote. It's Jim Crow in the 21st century. Republican lawmaker Burgess Owens disagrees. It is disgusting and offensive to compare the actual voter suppression and violence of that era that we grew up in with a state law that only asked that people show their ID. This is the type of fear mongering I expect in the 1960s, not today. The black leaders claim that Democrats' real agenda is for the federal government to take control of voting rules. They're referring to Democrats' H.R. 1 bill. The House passed it in March. It would make many of the temporary election changes from the pandemic permanent. The letter concludes, political agendas that have nothing to do with enhancing election security and voter access are involved. If we sincerely hope to make it easier for all Americans to vote and harder for those who want to cheat, attacking the people of Georgia is not a solution. NTD reached out to the White House for comment but haven't heard back. Montana becomes the latest state to tighten election security. The state passes two new laws, and Montana Democrats are suing to block them. Montana Governor Greg Gianforte signed two new election security bills into law. He sent out a tweet praising the laws. These new laws establish new best practices to ensure the continued integrity of Montana's elections for years to come. One bill requires voters to register by noon the day before an election. The other tightens voter ID requirements. State Senator Mike Cuff sponsored the voter ID bill. He released a statement saying, Election integrity is truly the rock, the cornerstone of our nation. And voter ID is a key component in protecting the integrity of Montana elections. State Representative Sharon Grief sponsored the voter registration bill. She says Americans are blessed with the right to vote, but they also have the responsibility to register. She says same-day registration causes lines and delays on election day. Attorney Mark Ellis is well known for representing Democrats in election cases. 
He claims the Montana laws are designed to suppress votes. He says they especially target young and elderly voters and indigenous communities. Ellis says he's already filed suit against the laws on behalf of the Montana Democratic Party. He claims the laws are aimed at imaginary ideas of voting fraud. But Cuff says the bills have no reference to any claim of fraud. The law's fate will now be decided in the courts. Officials in Arizona on Wednesday gave the media a look at the transfer of 2020 election materials, including ballots and tabulation equipment. They were transported in response to an Arizona Senate subpoena for a Republican-led audit of the election. Arizona was one of the battleground states at the center of attention as votes were tallied last November. The audit focuses on Maricopa County. Those leading the effort allege widespread election fraud took place there. Dozens of lawsuits have been filed over the matter. The Maricopa County Elections Department has also held two independent audits. Officials with the department say they've taken precautions to ensure the safety, security, and integrity of the subpoenaed election material. Three Democrat members of Congress are calling for Justice Amy Coney Barrett to recuse herself from an upcoming Supreme Court case. They say Barrett is biased because one of the litigants supported her nomination. Democrat Senators Sheldon Whitehouse and Richard Blumenthal, along with Representative Hank Johnson, wrote a letter to Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett requesting she take herself off a case. The case involves a question of donor privacy. California requires charities to give them the top names of donors. The Americans for Prosperity Foundation, or AFPF, is a party to the case. They argue the rule is a violation of privacy. Donors could be harmed, threatened, or harassed. The Democrat lawmakers say AFPF funded a seven-figure national advertising campaign to support Barrett's nomination to the court. They say that creates a conflict of interest. They cite a federal law that says, any justice, judge, or magistrate judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Kurt Levy is president of the Committee for Justice. He tells the Epoch Times the recusal request is absurd. He says it's not customary to recuse yourself when a group supports you, and that argument doesn't work because you can't decide if someone supports you or not, and a party with an interest in a lawsuit could support a judge or justice to force them off a case. He says the custom is to recuse yourself if you've donated to a group or served on their board. The AFPF case is scheduled to come before the Supreme Court on April 26th. The governor of North Dakota vetoes a bill that bans transgender biological male athletes from participating in women's sports. Republican Governor Doug Burgum argues that the state already has sufficient rules in place governing the issue. He also warned that since the bill does not apply to tribal or privately funded schools, it could create the potential for an uneven playing field. He mentioned that there are regulations already in place under the High School Activities Board for transgender male athletes wishing to participate in women's sports. The regulations do not bar them outright. It comes amid an effort by Republican-led states to enact laws that would block biological males from participating in women's sports. The bills acknowledge the inherent biological differences between male and female student athletes. An officer-involved shooting in Ohio resulted in the death of a 16-year-old girl. In an unusual move, the Columbus Police Department released body cam footage just hours after the incident. NTD's Christina Kim tells us what happened in Columbus. On April 20th in Columbus, Ohio, 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant died after a fatal police shooting. Police responded to a 911 call about an attempted stabbing. The Columbus Police Department quickly released body camera footage of the incident. In a slowed down version of the footage, you can see an officer approaching a driveway where a group of people are standing. Micaiah lunges at one woman and tries to stab her. The woman falls down. She then lunges at another girl with the same knife. As the knife nears the girl's neck area, the officer fires what sounds like four shots, hitting Bryant. That's what the police That's did. That lady she, came on the up, floor. she came after me. With so, a knife? Yeah, so, she, so he got her. Officials say they requested a medic 90 seconds after the shots were fired. Six minutes later, a medic arrived on the scene and Bryant was transferred to the hospital, where she was later pronounced dead. 
Micaiah's aunt Hazel Bryant told 10TV her niece lived in a foster home in the area and had gotten into a fight with someone else at the home. Her mother said Micaiah was a loving girl who promoted peace. Ned Pettis, the director of public safety, says he understands the outrage and emotion around this incident. A teenage girl is dead. And she's dead at the hands of a police officer. Under any circumstances, that is a horrendous tragedy. But he says the video footage shows that there's more to the story. And though it's hard, wait for the facts as determined by an independent investigation. We have to ask ourselves, what information did the officer have? What did he see? How much time did he have to assess the situation? And what would have happened if he had taken no action at all? Interim Police Chief Michael Woods was asked if the officer should have used a taser instead of a firearm. If there's not deadly force being uh, per per perpetrated on someone else at that time, an officer may have the opportunity to have cover, distance, and time to use a taser. But if those things aren't present and there is an active assault going on in which someone could lose their life, the officer can use their firearm to protect that third person. Mayor Andrew Ginther says the city will prioritize more transparency and take steps so this doesn't happen again. He also said the community needs to address the recent spike in violent crime and to give young people a positive path to a brighter future. Christina Kim, NTD News. House has just passed a bill that would limit the president's ability to restrict people from entering the U.S. It's a response to Trump-era travel bans on predominantly Muslim countries. NTD's Melina Wisecup has the details. The No Ban Act was introduced by California Democrat Judy Chu. It would strip a sitting president of the power to issue travel bans from certain countries, even if those countries are deemed as national security threats. The bill reads, before imposing a restriction, the State Department and DHS shall consult with Congress. It also prohibits religious discrimination in immigration decisions. The Democrat-backed bill is based on a years-long narrative that Trump's travel ban was an act of discrimination against Muslims and against African nations. President Biden rescinded the bans, but we must pass the No Ban Act to prohibit any future president from issuing discriminatory bans. In 2018, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Trump's order, saying it had legitimate purposes, preventing entry from nationals who cannot be adequately vetted. House Republicans say labeling Trump's ban as discriminatory is inaccurate because it was meant to protect America from nation states rife with terrorism. It is literally not true. It is absolutely not true. Given that policy covers just 8% of the world's Muslim population and is limited to countries that were previously designated by Congress or prior administrations as posing national security risks. He's referring to the fact that former President Obama designated seven Middle Eastern countries as areas of concern. The bill that they all voted for in 2015 that Obama signed into law called the Visa Waiver Program Improvement and Terrorist Travel Prevention Act of 2015. Trump's ban, now rescinded by Biden, restricted travel from 13 countries, including Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, Yemen, and others. Trump this week called on Biden to reinstate the travel ban to protect America from terrorism. But this bill would make it impossible for Biden or any future president to create such a ban. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. The U.S. State Department added at least 116 countries to its Level 4 Do Not Travel Advisory list. Included on the list are the U.K., Canada, France, Israel, Mexico, and Germany. It cites a very high level of COVID-19 in those areas. The United States this week added over 100 countries to its Level 4 Do Not Travel Advisory list, including the U.K., Canada, France, and Israel. On Monday, the State Department said it would expand that list to curb visits from about 80 percent of countries worldwide. Before Tuesday, only 34 countries were on the red list. Now it has 150. The recommendations are not mandatory and do not bar Americans from international travel. Other countries like Finland, Egypt and Mexico were added to the Do Not Travel advisory, while others remained at a level 3 recommendation of reconsider travel like China and Japan. 
As for entering the country, Washington has already barred nearly all non-U.S. citizens. If they've recently been in China, Brazil, Iran, South Africa, or most of Europe. And on Tuesday, the U.S. extended its restrictions on non-essential travel across the Canada and Mexico borders. The CDC said fully vaccinated people could travel safely within the U.S., but its director discouraged Americans from doing so, citing regional surges in cases. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo joined Republican lawmakers in unveiling a new bill called the Max Pressure Act. They want to maintain the Trump administration's maximum pressure strategy of sanctions on Iran. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo joins nearly 30 members of the Republican Study Committee on Capitol Hill Wednesday. They unveil the Max Pressure Act, introduced by Congressman Jim Banks. We will fight to maintain sanctions on Iran and show our adversaries that if Joe Biden temporarily lifts sanctions, we will reimpose them later. Banks says the Max Pressure Act is inspired by Pompeo and was drafted in consultation with him. It seeks to maintain the Trump administration's sanction strategy for Iran and only lift those sanctions when Iran meets the 12 demands that Pompeo outlined when he was in office. The bill would also introduce other bipartisan safeguards and protocols on making future deals with Iran. I hope it becomes bipartisan. This isn't about Republicans or conservatives or Democrats. This is about the security of America. The 12 demands that the U.S. issued in 2018 include asking Iran to stop enriching uranium, to give inspectors unqualified access to all sites in the country, and to end Iran's support of terrorists. Which of those 12 does anyone find unreasonable? These are expectations we ask of every country, and there is no reason we ought not to place sanctions on the Iranians until they comply with these basic norms of civilized nations. The Biden administration is in discussion with signorities to the Obama-era nuclear deal with Iran. Former President Trump withdrew from it in 2018. Many Republican lawmakers are concerned that by re-entering the deal, the Biden administration would lift sanctions on Iran. Representative Andy Barr says the new act will include an important provision to prevent that. It's the provision that would require any revival of the Iran nuclear deal to be submitted to the Senate as a treaty, requiring a supermajority to ratify it as a treaty as opposed to just a unilateral action of the Biden administration. The new bill has 83 original co-sponsors so far. If passed, it would make it much harder for the Biden administration to enter an agreement with Iran. A bill in Texas would commemorate a day for victims of communism. The Texas House recently passed it. The author of the bill tells NTD why he believes it's crucial that Texans memorialize victims of communism. NTD's Allison Lee has the story. So uh, HB 1057 creates an annual Memorial Day for victims of communism. Um, and it commemorates, or, or it is set on November 7th, which is the day that the Bolsheviks seized power uh, from the Russian government and established the first ever communist regime. In just 100 years, communism has been responsible for the deaths of at least 100 million innocent people. This is more than any other event in human history. Oliverson tells NTD this is why we need to dedicate a day to commemorate those people. Texas State Representative Tom Oliverson introduced House Bill 1057 earlier this year, and it passed the Texas House overwhelmingly last week. A Senate committee is currently looking at the bill. So that we never forget the tragedy, just the unbelievable human tragedy uh, that communism has left in its wake, and so that our children and our children's children never forget that communism um, makes a lot of empty promises and delivers on misery. He says, when he talks to people, we have escaped communist regimes. He always reminded of how miserable life is under communism. Oliverson fears that young people in this country aren't aware of those atrocities. He gives forced organ harvesting in communist China as an example. I was horrified um, in conversations that I've heard, had recently to learn of the Chinese government's abuses of political prisoners by forcing them to donate organs uh, for transplantation against their will. In fact, 
Researchers say these innocent, unwilling donors die painfully in the operating tables. It's a secretive and extremely lucrative venture for China's communist regime. To stop forced organ harvesting in China, Oliverson has introduced another bill that will prohibit Texas from awarding research grants to entities that partner with Chinese hospitals and organ transplantation. Going forward, he hopes people can take a moment on November 7th to think about the atrocities of communism. Hopefully, just like we remember the Holocaust and we remember the horrors of the Nazi regime and fascism, that we would also remember, equally so, that communism itself uh, is an equal, if not greater, threat to innocent human life. Oliverson urges people who have left communist countries to speak up and share their life experiences. In 2017, then-President Donald Trump established the first National Day for victims of communism on November 7th. Since then, at least 10 states have followed suit. Florida lawmakers unanimously passed similar legislation on Wednesday. Allison Lee, NTD News. Some Oklahoma lawmakers are pushing back against President Biden's executive orders. The state Senate passed a bill that would allow the state to request exemptions from the executive orders if they are deemed unconstitutional. And secret bars hidden in a New York City subway station boast a waiting list of 2,000 people, though New York City lockdown restrictions are still in place. Find out more in just a minute. Oklahoma State Senate lawmakers passed a bill on Tuesday to push back against President Joe Biden's executive orders. While Democrats call the bill a political stunt, Republicans are divided on the original language of the State House bill. More from our reporter Estelle Lynn at the Oklahoma State Capitol. On Tuesday, Oklahoma State Senate passed a bill that would allow the state attorney general to request exemptions from any executive orders issued by President Joe Biden if those orders are determined to be unconstitutional. Several state lawmakers voiced their support for this bill to protect Oklahomans from potential overreach of federal laws signed by President Biden. Those of us that are pro-life had to be stunned when one of the first move of this president through executive order was to allow your tax dollars to be spent for abortions, not just in the United States, but outside this country. The original version of the bill, passed by 79 members of the State House of Representatives, would even give the majority of state lawmakers the power to directly nullify presidential executive orders. However, this nullification clause was met with opposition, not only from the Democrats, but also the Republican Senate leader. Republican State Senate pro temp Greg Treat issued a statement saying, as originally written, HB 1236 gives people false hope because it is an unconstitutional nullification bill that clearly violates separation of powers. The Tenth Amendment says powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states. However, the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution states the federal constitution takes precedence over state laws. So there's some who just really want to push back on federal overreach as I desire and I think the majority of members of this body wish to do and it's well within our right to do it but you do not push back on the federal government by willfully violating the very constitution that we're sworn to uphold. Treat removed the original nullification clause and proposed to create a special task force under the state attorney general's office to evaluate the constitutionality of presidential executive orders and the new unit would be funded with $10 million each year to carry out its mission. This bill does what the bill that came over from the House did not do. It has teeth in it. Have we ever put $10 million be behind a legal remedy to push back on the federal government? Today you have an opportunity to do just that. Treat's changes to the bill placed him under fire from fellow Republicans. Hundreds of activists from gun rights and other conservative groups rallied at the state capitol on Tuesday to criticize him for watering down the bill. Several co-authors, including Senator Nathan Dom, removed their names from the amended bill. Treat says his changes are necessary to push the bill through if the bill crashes there won't be any other vehicle to protect Oklahomans from federal laws that violate the separation of powers. Estelle Lynn, NTD News, Oklahoma. 
In Washington, D.C., prosecutors are offering a plea deal to two teenagers. The two teenage girls are charged with murdering an Uber Eats driver. NTD, NTD's Lin Lin brings us that and more on the surge of carjackings in the nation's capital. Lawyers said Tuesday they're negotiating a plea bargain in the case of two teen girls charged with felony murder and armed carjacking in D.C. The victim, 66-year-old Uber Eats driver Mohammed Anwar. Both girls are being prosecuted as juveniles, even though D.C. law allows 15-year-olds who commit the most serious crimes to be tried as adults. D.C. police told WUSA 9 there's a surge in carjackings throughout the city, and most of those arrests involve children. The outlet says D.C. had more than 100 carjackings in the first quarter of this year. That's almost five times the same time last year. D.C. police say they've set up a team of detectives specialized in robberies and violent crimes to address the surge in carjackings. Lin Lin, NTD News, Washington, D.C. A little bar in New York City has a waiting list of 2,000 people. The La Knox Cocktail Lounge is tucked away in a subway station. It serves as an oasis from the street noise above ground and the screeching trains below. Go down the New York City subway steps at 28th Street on the one train, and it's easy to walk by this unassuming door, which when opened, reveals a clandestine bar hidden in plain sight, tucked between the staircase and the train platform. La Noche, a bar the size of only roughly 500 square feet, was ready to open last year just as the health crisis hit New York in March. So it had to push back the opening until October. But since then, it's become a hot spot with a waiting list 2,000 people strong, a tall order for such a small place. That's because New York City hasn't totally lifted all restrictions from the crisis, which means La Noche can only have up to 12 people in at one time between the limited hours of 5 p.m. and midnight. But why an underground bar and a subway? Most people are usually trying to get out of the transit system as soon as they can. Petty says what this location lacks in size, it makes up in novelty. We all fell in love with New York for one reason, is because uh, in many places in New York, so the subway being the number one place is like that. Different in race, in gender, in uh, economic background, can still talk to, to, together and party together in New York. And that's, I think, why New York is uh, one of the best in the world, you know. Ah, the mingling of more than just ingredients in your favorite drink. Add in a background soundtrack from the rumbles of the subway and La Noche could be the perfect getaway once the daily commute is back in full force without even going back above ground. Still to come, NASA successfully creates oxygen on Mars. It's the start of what could help an astronaut breathe or help provide fuel to get back to Earth. And movie makers and fans lament permanent theater shutdowns. A number of cinemas are closing because of economic losses brought on by extended lockdowns. But fans say nothing can replace the movie experience. That and more here on NTD News. When the game's over and it's time to go home, sometimes your car has other plans. That's why I drive with Car Shield. As expensive as car repairs can be, I wanted the best defense around. And with Car Shield's administrators, they make sure that you don't get stuck with expensive car repairs like this. Did I forget to mention that with Car Shield's network, I also get 24 7 roadside assistance, towing, and rental car reimbursement included. That's peace of mind every driver needs. I saved close to $9,000. If it wasn't for Car Shields, I wouldn't have my car. I got to tell you, it's quite a relief not to worry about expensive car breakdowns anymore. And with Car Shields administrators, you can choose your favorite mechanic or dealer to do the work. Plus, it's easier than ever to get America's favorite car protection. There's no long-term contracts, and coverage is affordable for every wallet size. If I didn't have Car Shield, I would have been out of pocket $7,000. And as a parent of three, I couldn't have that. I trust Car Shield administrators because they paid my claim. Talk about MVP protection for less than the cost of a ball game. Take it from me, the boomer. Nobody wants to go through the headache of an expensive car breakdown on their own. If you're driving without a warranty, you have to call Car Shield. Yeah, you do. So do yourself and your car a favor. Call Car Shield. They're your best line of defense against expensive breakdowns. 
Car Shield administrators paid almost $4,000 for my repairs. Car Shield is wonderful. They saved me $1,300. With Car Shield, I saved $4,100 on my first repair. Over a million happy drivers couldn't be wrong. Call CarShield now. Protect yourself now against expensive auto repair bills. Call CarShield for a free and instant protection plan quote. Once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 800-781-2990. 800-781-2990. The governor of California declares a state of emergency in two counties because of drought conditions. It marks the state's second year without enough rain. Governor Gavin Newsom's emergency order aims to inform Californians about drought conditions and encourage water conservation. The dec declaration applies to both Mendocino and Sonoma counties. Newsom made the announcement in person at Lake Mendocino and used the backdrop to illustrate the drought severity. KCRA reports that he said the lake was just over 40% capacity, while nearby Lake Sonoma measured just over 60% capacity. Newsom's order states that much of the western U.S. is dealing with drought conditions. It adds there are drought or near drought throughout many portions of the state. He told the press the emergency order will likely expand statewide. As Hollywood prepares to celebrate the year's best films, many movie theaters are struggling to reopen after a year with no income, and some have shut down for good. This is the historic San Francisco theater where Mario Maganam had some of his first dates with his wife. Lots of James Bond movies here. The marquee of the Cine Arts at the Empire Theater, which had been showing movies since the silent film era, is now blank. And cardboard and paper cover the box office window. It served notice in February that it was permanently closing after many months of lockdowns. News that hit Maganam hard. I guess there's just a certain affinity and I have a, a certain attachment to this theater because I grew up with it. Kind of like losing part of the community when you lose a theater like this. As vaccinated Americans emerge from their homes, they also may find their neighborhood theater is not there to greet them. Following a year of closures, theaters face unpaid rent, plus media companies focus on drawing customers to streaming services. But those making the films in Hollywood, some of whom will be at the 93rd Academy Awards on Sunday, want cinemas to thrive. It's the only place where the, the art dominates. Including director James Cameron, who made Avatar, the highest grossing film of all time. When you watch something on streaming, the other people in the room with you are welcome to interject, to pause, to go to the bathroom, um, to text, to do other things. It's the only place where we literally make a pact with ourselves to go and spend two to three hours in a focused enjoyment of the, of the art piece. In the movie theater, you have the complete experience as the artist intended it, and that will always be sacred. Like Cameron, industry leaders project optimism, forecasting a big rebound after restrictions ease and studios unleash new blockbusters. For Moganam, his beloved theater won't be there to experience a pop if there is one. I remember the theater when it was a single screen theater where everyone came in and it was one screen, one audience. He says during those days, the theater was almost always full. Church and Dwight is recalling certain gummy vitamins after two reports of customers finding metallic mesh in the products. The items were manufactured between October 29th and November 3rd of last year. They were sold online and in store between November and April of this year. The recalled VitaFusion products include Kids Melatonin, FiberWell, SleepWell, and Multivites. Only bottles with certain lot codes and expiration dates are included in the recall. And a list of that identifying information is on the FDA website. NASA announced on Wednesday that its Perseverance rover has extracted the first sample of oxygen from Mars. NASA has announced yet another first on Mars Wednesday, having literally created oxygen out of the red planet's thin air. 
That's thanks to an experimental device carried by the six-wheeled rover vehicle called Perseverance that landed there in February. The gadget is called MOXIE and in its first activation it created 5 grams of oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars, which is mostly carbon dioxide. That's enough for an astronaut to breathe for 10 minutes. It may sound small but that's big news, marking the first experimental extraction of natural resources from another planet that humans can directly use. NASA says it's the first technology of its kind that may help future missions live off the land of another world. Oxygen is needed not only to see humans on Mars someday, it is also crucial for the fuel to get them home. MOXIE's success comes a day after another achievement on Mars. With a miniature robot helicopter, NASA pulled off the first controlled powered flight of an aircraft on another planet. Coming up, suspected Chinese hackers spying on the U.S. defense industry. How did they get through, and how long has it been going on? And while Congress is divided on whether to modernize America's nuclear forces, two Pentagon leaders are warning that China and Russia have been upgrading their nuclear arsenals. That and more on NTD News. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom released their annual report for 2020. They say the Chinese regime's human rights abuses could be the worst development of all. NTD's Don Tran has the details. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom says religious freedom in China has deteriorated. The commission says the Chinese Communist regime has intensified its persecution of Christians, Muslims and other spiritual groups. The regime detained millions of Uyghur Muslims in labor camps and has continued its decades-long practice of forcibly removing organs from live Falun Gong practitioners. It's disgusting. How does this represent the values of the Chinese people? It does not, but it does represent the values of the Chinese Communist Party. A bipartisan group of lawmakers recently introduced new legislation to stop China's state-sanctioned practice of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. The bill would allow the U.S. to sanction any individuals and government officials responsible for organ harvesting. USCIRF Commissioner Gary Bauer says the bill is heartening, but that much more needs to be done. Uh, our own government needs to keep the pressure on in international bodies. Uh, we need to keep raising these issues in any bilateral negotiations with the Chinese government. And we need to speak up for the oppressed people living under Chinese communist rule. As one of his last actions, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo declared the Chinese regime's treatment of Uyghur Muslims genocide. Some researchers have also labeled the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners as genocide. Bauer says the world should keep a close watch on it. But it's certainly the kind of thing that we've seen in the past where an oppressive government uh, tries in a variety of ways to eliminate a whole group of people, whether it's an ethnic group or a religious group or people that follow a particular uh, philosophy. The commission urges the U.S. to redesignate China as a country of particular concern and to enforce existing laws to the fullest extent on the Chinese Communist Party. Don Tran, NTD News. Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and three House Republicans are introducing a new bill. It aims to block China and other adversaries from buying land near U.S. military bases. If passed, the bill would prevent Communist China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea from buying land within 100 miles of any U.S. military installation or within 50 miles of any military area on U.S. soil. It would also allow the Department of Defense to block construction in areas under investigation. Senator Cruz said the bill ensures regimes like the Chinese Communist Party don't have the ability to intercept and disrupt military activities. A cybersecurity firm says Chinese hackers have been spying on the U.S. defense industry for months, but we don't yet know which agencies or contractors have been breached. NTD's Patrick Hayden takes a look. Researchers say that at least two groups of China-linked hackers have spent months spying on the U.S. defense industry. A previously undisclosed vulnerability in American virtual private networking devices was used by the hackers. 
Utah-based IT company Avanti issued a statement on Tuesday confirming the vulnerability and says that a very limited number of customers were targeted. These were customers that used Avanti's Pulse Connect Secure Suite. At the same time as Avanti's announcement, cybersecurity firm FireEye released a statement. It said it suspected that at least one of the hacking groups was operating on behalf of the Chinese government. The president of an arm of FireEye, Mandiant, says the hackers were operating from US digital infrastructure. They have been borrowing naming conventions of their victims to camouflage their activity. A Chinese embassy spokesperson says China firmly opposes and cracks down on cyber attacks and says FireEye's allegations are irresponsible and ill-intended. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. The U.S. National Security Agency declined to comment on the issue. For years, American officials have blamed Chinese state-backed hackers for a number of digital attacks, from theft of American military secrets to research data. Back in 2020, cybersecurity company FireEye sounded the alarm about a Chinese hack targeting devices made by two U.S. tech companies. The attackers infiltrated a number of companies' computer systems in the attempt. FireEye has called the breach one of the biggest cyber attacks by a Chinese hacker it's seen in years. While Congress is fighting over the U.S. defense budget, two Defense Department officials warn about a rising nuclear threat. The danger comes from two of America's biggest adversaries. NTD's Juliet Song has more on that. If that fails... The man overseeing America's nuclear forces is giving lawmakers a serious warning. That's as Congress debates whether to stop modernizing America's nuclear weapons. For the first time in our history, the nation is facing two nuclear-capable strategic peer adversaries at the same time. One of those adversaries is China. Richard says the Chinese Communist Party is rapidly expanding and upgrading its nuclear weapons arsenal. They are well ahead of the pace to double their stockpile by the end of the decade. And I further submit that the size of a nation's weapons stockpile by itself is a very crude measure of what they can do with that capability. He says Beijing is now able to deploy nuclear weapons in its own region and will soon be able to reach other continents. I offer for China it is important to look at what they do, not what they say, and where they're going, not where they are. And I have no choice but to view China as a significant strategic threat and share Secretary Austin's assessment that China is the pacing threat for the nation and DOD at large. And China's military threat doesn't stop by land or the sea. It also comes from space. The U.S. Space Commander Chief says right now, China has more than 400 satellites in orbit. China is building military space capabilities rapidly, including sensing and communication systems and numerous anti-satellite weapons. All the while, China continues to maintain their public stance against the weaponization of space. On top of that, the Defense Department official says Russia also remains a pacing nuclear threat. Aggressively engaged conventional and nuclear capability development, modernization, and are now roughly 80 percent complete, while we are at zero. It is easier to describe what they're not modernizing, nothing, than what they are, which is pretty much everything. Item 133, first stage ignition, two missiles. He says America's nuclear force is hindered by aging weapons and underinvestment. A nation simply cannot attempt to indefinitely life extend leftover Cold War weapons systems and successfully carry out the assigned strategy. The Defense Department says maintaining a powerful and advanced nuclear arsenal is critical for America's national security. And it comes with an expensive price tag. Modernizing America's nuclear forces could cost $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years. Some Democrat lawmakers are urging the Biden administration to cut the funding, but they've received strong pushback from Republicans. It remains to be seen how the spending battle will turn out. The Biden administration is currently reviewing nuclear strategies and is set to present a full defense budget this spring. Juliet Song, NTD News. Coming up, the owner of a Paris chocolate shop struggles under lockdown restrictions and tries to keep her beloved business alive, but the lack of tourists makes it hard. 
and a London firm sees a rise in demand for garden offices. They provide a relaxing setting for people working from home. The company is getting orders from across Europe. More on that in just a moment. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explain life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times. I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Prosecutors are preparing charges against dozens of employees at an Italian company after wrapping up a probe of a bridge collapse that killed 43 people. It killed 43 people and laid bare the decrepit state of Italy's infrastructure. Now prosecutors have wrapped up an investigation of the 2018 bridge collapse in Genoa. They are preparing possible charges against dozens of former employees of Atlantia. That's the firm that was responsible for maintaining the crossing. Documents show government officials could also face charges. 69 individuals, including Atlantia's former chief executive, have been placed under investigation during the probe. Suspected crimes include manslaughter and willful disaster. Under Italian law, firms can be held responsible for their employees' actions. Atlantia is controlled by the Benetton family of clothing store fame. They're in talks with a government-backed consortium to relinquish control of the firm. None of the companies or individuals involved would comment on the new reports. A replacement bridge has already been constructed and open to traffic. It took around 18 months to put up. The legal fallout from the disaster may take much longer to clear. Bankruptcy is threatening local Parisian shops more than ever. They've been hit especially hard by restrictive measures that prevent tourists from entering the country. NTD's French correspondent, David Vives, interviews the well-loved owner of a well-loved sweet shop. At 84 years old, Denise Akabo feels full of energy when she works in her shop of 45 years. Here she sells fine chocolates and premium candy. The treats come from all across France, like this chocolate clementine from Corse Island. When you put it in your mouth, you have to roll it around inside. If you gobble it down in a few seconds, I'm not selling it to you. Everyone from French presidents to American actors have visited her shop. But the tourists are the most important customers. Tourism is a top economy activity in France. But since the first lockdown last year, many businesses are going bankrupt. Last year, during the first lockdown, I was earning like 6 euros a day. 
One day I got 30 euros. That was a good day. I was just sinking, crying every evening. The fate of Akabo's shop is uncertain. She's already two months late on her rent, and her daughter is pressing her to sell the shop. But she's keeping faith, and her routine goes on. She tells the stories behind the candies to every client, and believes one day American tourists will be back. The American tourists used to empty my shelves of Cousins de Lyon. They loved it so much. You have Cousins de Lyon? Yes, I have Cousins de Lyon. Akabo decorates her shop with presents from visitors. Paris residents also come to comfort her, knowing she needs support. I come regularly. I like chocolate, and it seems this place has a soul. I feel good when I'm here. She says the lockdown has changed the face of the French capital. These are very, very hard times. A lot of shop owners have sold their shops. Something is changing in Paris. I try to tell myself just live each day as it is. We don't know what's going on. Some of the restrictive measures will be lifted on May 7th. For Akabo, it's one step closer to the day tourists will return. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And with more people working from home, they are seeking alternative workspaces. One London firm is offering a pre-made home office that you can set up right in your own backyard. NTD's Colin Fredrickson takes a look. On the outskirts of London, an unexpected consequence of the pandemic, garden offices like this one are seeing high demand as part of a trend toward alternative workplaces. In the first two weeks, we got like hundreds of emails from everywhere. The modular home office is designed to be a cozy hideout for gardens and courtyard spaces. So everyone was like really squeezing their living room uh, spaces while in the backyard there was a garden or there was a, a, an empty space that could be used. The first client it was like someone that's had to work from home, has a family and uh, probably two kids and he, he, needed, he desperately needed a, a, a safe place where to concentrate. The eight-foot-tall structure is digitally fabricated, then constructed on site in about a day. A basic module cost about $7,000. The company is hoping to deliver about 15 units this year. One client from Norway is expecting hers later this month. I do my trombone practicing, I do my paint, everything, everything in the same room. And I just thought I need a space where I need, um, where I have uh, something for my mind and something that can give me more clarity. And she's looking forward to showing off her new workplace on video calls. It will be um, a multi-use place. I will definitely have the space to do my work and the envy of my colleagues on the Zoom calls and team calls when they see my background. <laughs> the design firm's co-founder says they're now looking into offering more choices like different exterior options, internal finishes and customized furniture sets. Alan Fredrickson, NTD News. Let's turn our attention to health and wellness now. After months of wind, cold, and stuffy indoor conditions, your skin may be a little bit dry or damaged. Our next story offers some ideas. To Strong Mind and Body, I'm Gina Marie. With spring in the air and winter receding, we may find our skin a bit worse for wear. Let's take a look at some simple, natural and effective things that you can do to help remedy the impact of winter. Moisturize. Moisturizing means adding water to the skin and locking it in. Moisturizing should be a daily part of your skincare routine. So the best way to apply moisturizer is to rub it directly onto damp skin straight after your bath or shower. Over-the-counter moisturizers often include alcohol and fragrances, some of which may irritate or dry out the skin. Try some natural solutions. So coconut oil has been shown in studies to be a safe and effective way to hydrate dry skin. Honey has also been shown to improve dry skin, including eczema and decrease skin inflammation. Aloe vera not only moisturizes the skin, but it also relieves redness and irritation. Humidify. Cold weather is not the only thing that leads to dry skin. The dry heat inside can also add to it. Running a humidifier is a great way to soothe and prevent dry, itchy or irritated skin. Recommendations vary, but on average, keeping moisture levels somewhere between 50 to 60% should be sufficient to help dry skin. 
be gentle. Since many soaps are actually formulated to remove oils from the skin, they can also remove moisture at the same time. It's a good idea to use facial cleansers and body washes that are either unscented or for sensitive skin. So be sure to avoid deodorants and soaps that have things like alcohols and perfumes. Using laundry detergents and fabric softeners that are free of perfumes and dyes can help to prevent and improve dry skin. And although it may be very tempting, be sure not to scratch dry skin. Scratching not only irritates the skin, but it could cause micro tears that can introduce bacteria beneath the skin's surface. Develop skin-friendly bathing habits. So while the cold weather may tempt you to take longer and hotter showers, this may actually lead to dry skin. It's best to limit the time to no more than 10 minutes. Otherwise, the skin's oily layer may be stripped away, causing it to lose moisture. So if you want to get rid of dry skin, another tip is to have a warm bath, add about one cup of oatmeal and soak for about 15 minutes once a week. That should take care of dry skin issues. Oatmeal has a high protein content and can leave a protective layer on the skin to help lock in moisture. Oatmeal is also great for soothing eczema. So by employing some of these simple tips, you can keep your skin healthy, hydrated, and ready for some of the warmer weather to come. And that's all for now. You can catch the news again this evening at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Steve Lance, in for Kevin Hogan. Have a great day. have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.